Hi again, Will Bostas here. What I'd like to do today is talk to you about how to run a coal forge. And I'll do some forging also to uh, illustrate how to take a heat and how to build a fire, how to build an open fire, how to build a cave, how to build a closed fire, um, how to coke your coal. If you're using coke, you don't have to coke your coal, but this is really more about coal. It translates if you're using coke, but most people are going to be finding coal, and I like coal better anyway. It gives you uh, more control over how you build your fire. So uh, I'm going to forge this uh, tool that I make. I call it a multi-tool. We teased on the last uh, video calling it a survival tool. Well, it's going to be like a stabbing tool, so you could use it as a survival tool. It'll have a bottle opener on one side and a <clears throat> pry screwdriver thing on the other. But what it'll do is kind of illustrate the sequences of forging square octagonal around it. I'll be using the coal forge it, to get the steel hot, and I'm going to show you how I get the end hot, I get the middle hot, how I control my heat with the coal forge, with the water, with the blast. So, we live next to the river and there are people hunting right now, so hopefully we don't get shot. So, uh, but it's worth it because we're doing this as a public service for our people that uh, are peeps that want to learn blacksmithing. So, I've sketched out some things, some ideas here at the chalkboard. And uh, in fact, I'm going to use a poker that we'll be using here in a minute as a pointer to talk about the coal forge. This would be a cross section through a coal forge. You'd have your hearth, and your hearth, the bigger the better, but uh, you know, maybe 30 inches, 36 inches uh, square or round. And then you mortise into that your fire pot. Your fire pot is made out of cast iron. And this is a cross section to your fire pot. The fire pot has flanges. So if you can mortise your fire pot underneath your hearth, then you're not gonna constantly run into the edges of your the flange on your fire pot. Fire pots are quite thick, especially if they're designed for coke, because coke burns it quite a bit hotter. It's got a lot more energy to it. So it'll heat up a standard fire pot. So you'll find those flanges quite thick. You can build this up with fire clay if you want, which is, you can make your own fire clay. You can get mud and you can mix some iron oxide into it. And, but that would make this hearth level so you don't constantly like stick uh, your bar into that flange. So what I have, I've uh, drawn these pieces of coal and they, uh, I wanted to illustrate that in a coal forge, you have different fires that you can use the bottom of the forge where the air comes in is immediately going to be oxidizing and then the further up you go is going to be neutral and in fact you can get to the top of the fire underneath the coal and you can do carburizing. Carburizing is something that they would do like to harden blades. Low carbon steel you could carburize and you could put carbon into it a couple thousands thick and you could actually get some hardness that's called case hardening. So when we build the fire, we want to make sure that we understand that that center is neutral. And the reason why that's neutral is because of the way that the forge is built. Now let's let's go over here, look at the blower. And the blower can be a hand crank blower. It can be a motorized blower with a rheostat. Uh, I have both on mine and I have a T down here. One goes to the hand crank and one goes to the motor blower. But I want to illustrate hand crank forging today. <clears throat> so right past your blower, you're gonna have some way of controlling the blast and it's called an air gate. And so I've got this air gate here. And so this handle would be coming at us and you've got this blade that fits into this slot. And so this is the cross section of that. You can see that sometimes people will drill a hole in their air gate, particularly for running coke, because you constantly want a blast on your coke to keep it hot, otherwise the coke will go out and you can push this air gate all the way through and it will really choke down the amount of air that you're using. You'd wanna use an air gate, particularly if you're using a, a motorized blower. You don't need an air gate if you're using a hand crank blower because you can control the amount of blast just from the crank. So I don't have an air gate on my forge, but I, I do have something I'll show you when we do crank it up that serves as an air gate, but you'll see that air gate. And I recommend 
getting used to using that air gate because if you've got a blower that you don't have rheostat on, it's just on and off, this is how you're gonna control your blast. If you don't control your blast, you're gonna be using a lot more fuel than you need. And fuel is expensive, so you wanna be as economical as you can with the fuel. So when you're ready to forge, you open up your air gate that, that feeds the fuel, the air to the fuel. When you remove your stock from the fire, you close your air gate unless you're forging two irons in the fire. So keep that in mind. The air gate needs to be something that you use all the time. Every time you pull your seal out of the fire, you shut your air gate. When you put it back in, you open your air gate. So that's with your motorized blower. Now, the air gate underneath the, the hearth, it goes into this thing called a twee air. And the twee air is a pipe that supplies the air to the bottom of the forge. So uh, the air will go up. It can also go down, but we close the bottom part of it with a dumping or a sliding ash gate because you need to have some way of removing the debris, the ash that accumulates at the bottom of your twee air. Now keep in mind though, that you may want to keep a little bit of ash down here and I'll show you just to make, just to seal the dumping or the sliding ash gate so you don't have any air loss down here. So frequently when I'm cleaning out my fire pot and I'll show you how to clean out a fire pot, um, I'll dump some more ash down there so that I make sure that it, it's like a gasket that allows more air to go up into my tweer, which then goes into my duck nest. My duck nest is down here. Now, before it passes through the duck nest, it's gonna be forced into this elliptical clinker breaker. So here's your elliptical clinker breaker, and it's shaped like a triangle so that it's flat on top normally. And then when the angle of, when your handle protrudes out of this, normally you have the handle pointed down so you know that the twee or the clinker breaker is flat. Now, if I rotate that clinker breaker, that point will come up and you need a clinker breaker, depending on how quality your coal is or how good you are as far as watching your steel on the fire. Because if you burn your steel on the fire, it's gonna accumulate down here uh, in your duck's nest and it's gonna uh, obscure the amount of air that you get out of your, uh, um, your tapered hole in the bottom of your fire pot. So, this clinker breaker is an important tool, but um, but really what I want to illustrate here is that the edges of the fire pot are angled where the clinker breaker, the elliptical clinker breaker comes in. So it forces the air to come up, then it squeezes the air and it directs the air into a this point. So you, this is a foci right here. And that foci is the hottest part of your fire and it's the neutral part of your fire and that's where you should be putting your steel. So I've got my steel bar illustrated with this blue line, and I wanna show you that you want to put your steel right at where that foci is from the shape, engineered shape of your fire pot, uh, helped out by the elliptical clinker breaker. So these are all important. This is why it's difficult to make your own fire pot because um, you have to engineer your own your elliptical clinker breaker in your own angle so that you can make sure that you have that foci of the air right here. It doesn't make much sense to come up here too high because you're not gonna get much heat. You're gonna get your carburizing heat here, the most intense heat here, and uh, you never wanna forge down here unless you wanna burn your steel. So beginner blacksmiths will actually put their bar in at an angle, right around you here. They'll come in at an angle and then they'll just burn the tip off. So you really want to come in there level as much as you can on your hearth where your walls are on your hearth. You want to have a cutout so that you can drop this so that it's level with the fire. You don't really want to come in at an angle. If you have to, you can take the heat and you can bend your steel so that you can come up above your flanges on your, uh, on, on your hearth. But if you've got cutouts, and I'll show you on mine, I've got cutouts, then you can lay it flat. So when we... Uh, when we begin, we're going to have what's called green coal. And green coal is coal that's never been fired. The type of coal we're using is bituminous coal. And so I've come down here to this like a little uh, chicken scratch that I've got. I've got anthracite, which is not a common coal that, that uh, is going to be used in the blacksmith shop. The most common coal that uh, is available to us is a bituminous coal. And it doesn't have quite as much energy as the anthracite does. But it's a pretty clean coal, especially if you get smithing coal. And smithing coal should be, should look something like this. They should, 
be the, not the size of your knuckles. The, if it's too big, like this, this piece of uh, Smith & Cole is too big. And it's not a very good quality of Smith & Cole because of the cleaving that it does. It, it breaks off and it creates what are called fines. And fines are okay. Um, this, will, this will create fines. And when you, when you get a, a coal that has that cleaving and it creates fines, it can be used, but you need to make a mud out of it first. Then when you subject that mud to heat, then it coalesces into a coke and it makes uh, more like a, a chunk of coal versus that flaky fine. Now, coal that you wanna avoid is coal that has quite a bit of sulfur in it. And you can see the sulfur in this, the yellowish color. So this is coal, but that coal has a lot of sulfur and that sulfur will be absorbed in your hot steel. Hot steel is like a sponge. It absorbs uh, elements from the atmosphere. So it absorbs oxygen, absorbs hydrogen, it absorbs sulfur, phosphorus. And these, these things, uh, they're deleterious to the quality of your forging. So you wanna be really careful about making sure that you have the best quality coal that's available within your budget. So uh, as, we, as we go down, we, it, the anthracite is greater than 85% carbon. The bituminous, 80% carbon. What's left uh, in your coals, you've got tar, you've got sulfur, you've got uh, some rare earth metals like mercury and that kind of thing. So you don't really wanna breathe a lot of the, the fumes that are coming off of your coal. And as you go further down on um, the quality, then the, those balances are even further of like sulfur and mercury and rare earth metals and, and things that just uh, uh, minerals that don't um, burn and they wind up as glassy clinkers in the bottom of your fire or fly ash. And we'll talk about that when we're forging because of poor quality coals will create fly ash. And that fly ash actually is pretty toxic too. Uh, industry has a difficult time getting rid of fly ash. So they sold the concrete industry on fly ash. And so the fly ash is used in lightweight, high strength concrete. And uh, yes, it works. It's one way of uh, getting rid of that industrial uh, byproduct. So uh, we have lignite and lignite is a poor quality coal. It has about 65% of carbon by volume. Uh, peat is a very young coal. It's buried uh, green moss. It's uh, in the millions of years, but versus the hundreds of millions of years for these. It has them subjected to the pressure that's required in order to compact it. But nevertheless, you can see when you start looking at how many BTUs per pound, you, if you even if you forged with peat, you could get 8,000 BTUs per pound. So it's less than 60% carbon, but that's not a bad figure because if we look over here to this theoretical formula, it requires about 12 uh, hundredths, uh, not 12, let me just back up on there, 0 0.120 BTU per pound per degree. So if I'm heating a one pound piece of steel and I need 2000 degree forging temperature, I multiply that by 0 0.120 and I require 240 BTUs for heat. So in a theoretical perspective, uh, I could get Mm, 40 heats out of a pound of peat, but you're also going to have factors of loss because not all of the uh, fuel that you're burning is going to go into the steel. Some is going to heat the fire pot, some is going to be adjacent to the steel. But nevertheless, uh, peat would have enough BTUs uh, in order to heat steel to a forging temperature, one pound of steel at forging temperature. If I was heating five pounds of steel at forging temperature, I'd need about 1,200 uh, BTUs. So uh, that, then I would be able to heat five pounds for um, five pounds of steel and I'd be able to heat it like eight times. So, so anyway, uh, we could use different fuels. The bituminous is, uh, has 12,000 BTUs per pound, which is quite dense. So it's 30% uh, more dense than the peat. Um, you can use charcoal. Uh, charcoal is a really nice fuel to use because it's a very clean fuel although it, it has 25% less BTUs than, uh, per pound than coal does. And when you look at it per pound, charcoal is very light. So it requires a lot more volume of charcoal in order to achieve that 9,000 BTUs per pound. 
So I've got a, uh, got a piece of charcoal here. This is charcoal. And uh, you can see it was once wood. And I would say that that weighs, I don't know, probably a quarter of a pound. So in order to get a pound of that, you're, gonna, you're looking at quite a bit of fuel, whereas this weighs, this weighs about a pound. And so I'm gonna say that it requires four, much, four times as much volume in order to achieve the same uh, amount of uh, quantity of heat. So it's just like the last video when I was talking about what does a hammer do? What does a round hammer do? What does a square hammer do? These are all fundamentals. We back up to these fundamentals and we start cognitively like inserting this and having a foundation of knowledge and that this gives us uh, a way to estimate how much, what type of fuel we're gonna use, how much fuel we're gonna use, what's the most advantageous to be the difference between, should I spread the metal round? Should I spread it square? Should I tilt the hammer? The same idea, we've talked about the gas forge, an atmospheric gas forge, we've talked about a uh, ribbon burner gas forge, we talked about the treadle torch, and then today we're gonna talk about the coal forge. And so these are all different tools, and you need to understand what each one of these tools do, as well as each one of these heat sources do. This is a piece of industrial coke, and uh, it's quite big. You don't wanna to try to forge with a piece of industrial coke this big. This needs to be broken up into chunks of uh, just like this so that uh, you get a lot of surface area. There's not, not there's too much, uh, all the surface area is, is locked up in this piece of coke, whereas when you break it up into smaller pieces, but again, they, these pieces can get so small they become fines, and we'll talk about fines, because I may have some fines in my coal. I've, I've been told that you can forge with manure. And when you look up the BTU amount in one pound of dry manure, we're looking at 8,500 pounds. But if you've ever picked up a cow patty, you know that it doesn't weigh very much. So you'd have to use quite a bit of manure in order to get hot, steel hot. Same thing with uh, hardwood and softwood. So charcoal is going to be a much more uh, efficient and clean way of getting the 9,000 BTUs per pound. You can burn hardwood and softwood, but you can imagine softwood weighs a lot less than hardwood and you're going to get less BTUs. You're also going to have to deal with the volatiles that burn out of wood. So that's why we'd want to use charcoal. And charcoal is it's pretty comparable to uh, lower quality uh, coal but the coal is gonna give you the most energy in the smallest uh, package. If we looked at it from the perspective of gasoline, gasoline, it will give you 17,000 BTUs per pound, but uh, it, it's, uh, there's some issues as far as using uh, fuels, um, liquid fuels as a heat source, but waste oil will give you about the same as gasoline will. And there are forges that are built out of waste oil, so that's something to take in consideration. I'm not going to recommend it because I'm not an expert as far as making it safe. But from a uh, compare and contrast perspective, I just wanted you to see uh, what we're looking at. The propane really has a lot of BTUs per pound, and uh, propane is just a very convenient fuel, very clean burning fuel, and so that's why a lot of smiths prefer the propane. But I'm going to I'm going to say that. The coal and the propane forges, as well as charcoal, they all have their unique uh, advantages and they also have their disadvantages. So I don't, I'm not going to say one is better than the other. I'm going to choose whatever I need based on uh, what, uh, what I need to, uh, the type of heat that I, that I need to have. The nice thing about coal forges is that you can really dial in your heat exactly where you want it. And I can get a temperature that's melting here and it's that's relatively in the black heat here and here and so that kind of power is uh is if you understand how to harness that power it's a very important tool in the blacksmith shop so what i'd do, like to do now is talk about uh how to light a fire i haven't lit that fire in a long time let me tell you that much so bear with me but i'm gonna but this is also good because this is when you walk up to your coal forge, if the person that was using the coal forge before you, and that person was me, if they were nice and thoughtful, then they would have coked some coal for you to start your fire with coke coal. 
if they didn't, if they burned it down to nothing, then they rudely left you with a fire uh, um, pan of ash and no coke. So, so I'm going to assume that the guy before me, which was me, uh, didn't leave me any coke. Let's just, let's just take a look. So I've got these paper bags and um, I may use the paper bags to start the fire. My traditional way of starting a fire was I would take a piece of newspaper, and this is a kind of an old piece of newspaper. I, um, hard to find newspaper anymore, but if you've got newspaper, two four sheets of newspaper. So there's two. And on the diamond, I'm gonna scrunch it up. And I'm gonna take a couple more. scrunch it up but it's hard to scrunch it up because that, may, that way that it burns with air um, inside if it's too compact so I'm going to overlap that and scrunch it up and I'm going to roll this into a donut Make sure it doesn't come apart because that, that creates an issue. But there's my donut. And what that'll do is I'll provide fuel, that readily burning fuel, in a circle, but it'll also allow the blast to come through the center of that donut. And the donut should fit in the bottom of your fire pot. So let's get a little closer here. Hopefully you guys can see it. It's an overcast day. And uh, I'm gonna clean out my fire pot. So I can tell you right now that there's some coke Here's some coke that's left over from the last forging, which is good. There's a lot of ash. And this looks like powdered coal, but it's not. It's actually ash. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with that here in it here before I fire it up. So this is all coke, and that's good. And coke is different than coal. It's it's lighter, but it's had the volatiles burned out. And so if you heat the coal without actually catching it on fire, it will absorb that heat and then it'll smoke. And then that smoke is your tar, your sulfur. That's what's burning out of it. And that's why they call coal that hasn't been burned green coal. Now, sometimes I'll have pieces of hardwood that I want to get rid of. And I'll use those to make the fire or they'll literally uh, add fuel to the fire. So we talked about those fuels. You can also use large pieces of coal or coke to reflect the heat back into the area of the fire that you want. So in my forge, you'll see these big chunks of coke and coal and if they're they're in there intentionally so i've got a good amount of coke to start the fire if you don't start your fire with coke it's going to be pretty smoky until you coke your coal all right so i'm getting to the bottom of my fire pot i'm going to put this donut here to the side but for now what i'm going to do is clean out my ash so here's some of the tools that we'll be using uh, a shovel a rake, a mop, a sprinkler, a saucer full of secrets, and uh, a flux spoon. So, uh, so right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm not gonna try to be too stingy, although um, I like to be as, as efficient as I can. I'm gonna scoop up this ash and get it out of my fire pot, out of my hearth and out of my fire pot because it's really not going to do me much good. So this is the first thing you start with in the day. And I'm going to continue to pull my um, the usable coke out of the fire, but don't get too deep. Let me turn this music down a little bit. How are we doing? Invisible? Okay, yeah. so here at the bottom, we're gonna have a little bit of clinker, and, and that's clinker that's from the coal that isn't the highest quality coal. You can see some of this coal didn't burn, and then it also mineralized, and it melted the sand or the uh, uh, different uh, types of minerals that were found in that, that soil when it got compacted. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna clean out to the bottom of my fire pot, and then down here you'll see my clinker breaker. 
Okay, so there's my clinker breaker. Now this is a Champion Whirlwind fire pot. So it's got a clinker breaker that kind of comes in like a scoop. So that breaks up your clinker on that side. That breaks up your clinker on that side. Make sure that your slot is open in the center. Now at the bottom of our fire pot, I've got a sliding ash gate. So I'm gonna, I'm going to get rid of my ash by opening up my ash gate. Reach your, reach your hand in there too, just to make sure that uh, there's not ash that's above that, that's kind of um, keeping it from uh, flowing freely. Then now, like I said before, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw a little bit of the ash down there and I'm not gonna clean that ash out. I'm actually going to use that as a gasket for the, the bottom of the fire pot. Okay, so now I need to get ready because this is the lighting of the, of the forge. So I've got my donut. My donut fits into the bottom of my fire pot. I'm gonna put some fuel into the bottom of the fire pot so that something is underneath the paper for it to burn. Then I'm gonna put some fuel closer to the sides all the way around it, get rid of that clinker. And that's why they call it a clinker. You can really, it sounds like glass and for some reason there's a lot of clinker that's uh, interspersed with this, but um, there's a good clink right there. So usually you find that at the bottom of your fire. Uh, if you don't, you're a genius because most of the time it's going to be from the coal or from your burning your steel. Okay, so now I'm ready to light the fire and I'm going to take a match. And I tell you what, before I start this, let me let me go over what I've got going on here. So I've got a electric blower. I'm not going to use that, but uh, I've got a, a little pilot. And here's that that T that I was talking about. So when I pull this, it's the electric blower. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I push this, it's the hand crank blower. But this is also my air gate, so I can have the full blast. So it's a, it's, a, it's a T that comes in and it's got a gate that either goes over here or a gate that goes over here. So that's what that knob does. It opens up that gate, pushes it one way or pushes it the other. So, so I use the, the electric. Um, it's very nice to, uh, to forge with an electric blower, but what I wanna do is I'm gonna use the Champion 400. It's a hand crank blower. And um, before you get started with your blower, you may wanna Put some lube in it because it might have been a while since the last time you so you pull that little top up and you put i like using chainsaw bar lube because it's got a lot of tack and i use that on the little giant power hammer i don't use it on the seha the Samac, because it requires 30 30 weight non-detergent um but uh, i i like the the chainsaw bar lube uh for uh anything that's got a splash lubrication so it's got a lot of tack and it just it won't um, fly off. So whatever, which way you're comfortable when you're using the blower, but a lot of times you can tell that a blower will be smoother one direction than the other. So this one actually is a little bit smoother counterclockwise. And so just make sure your blower is lubed up and uh, make sure that you can kind of sense what direction it. I'm going to go either way on this, but when I remember, I'll probably go counterclockwise because it's quite a bit smoother. It's nice to have a, a blower that's got this flywheel effect because that way it, it tapers down your flame instead of the instead of just shutting off the air. It'll it'll keep your forge going. So so the 400s are quite nice as far as having that flywheel effect. Okay. Uh, so I showed you my clinker breaker, fire pot tweeter, my sliding ash gate, my um, my gate, my air gate, that is also basically, uh, let me make sure that, okay, so that's, that's the blower and is my, um, my hand crank. Okay, so uh, on a hearth, I think it's kind of important to have a tool rest, just like on a gas forge. Um, that way you, you won't constantly like have things falling off of the hearth. 
So maybe not a bad idea to put one up there. This is not quite level. So this is level and this is gonna be my sweet spot right here when I get this fire going, about like that. So if I put a piece of steel in there, it'll be right in my sweet spot, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, otherwise, working with a coal forge is gonna be frustrating. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my donut, catch it on fire. And uh, you can start your draft. It didn't work. I'm gonna reach my finger now. <laughs> nice. There we go. You can start your draft by holding your your donut like this. This is where you get to play with fire, but really you're being serious. So put your put your donut down here. Let it let it get on fire. Give it a little bit of blast. And now I'm gonna cover up my donut with my coke or my call. Make sure you don't completely. right in the center. Now, as, as the paper starts to consume, I need to put coal in and pack it down to... When I start smelling the coal, seeing a little bit of a green flame, which is I'm seeing right now, smoke that you have. So try to uh, keep the flame going and if the flame is going out on you it's probably because you don't have a flu that's going directly from the take this, this rake and I'm going to push it down right in the center so the air has a place to pass. Pack the coal in. And I'm not going to pack it in on top. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take this shovel. I'm going to put coal in this five gallon bucket. Okay, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add water to it. And this will wet my coal and it will make the coal, so you want to make a, a slurry. And it will make the it will make the coal coke more easily. That's good. Now, when I put coal on my fire, it's going to be this soup. And this is what I was talking about as far as the the um, fines. If you find that the coal that you got in your bag is very fine, 
then you'll use the same procedure. You'll, in your five gallon bucket, you'll fill it about half full of the fines, and then you'll put enough water to make a, a mud. And what this does, you notice I, I still did put it on top of the fire, put it on the sides of the fire. Now I'm gonna open the fire up, the blue hole. That's, that's water that's evaporating in. It's also the coal is starting to burn. My, uh, my draft is set up pretty well. As that hood gets hotter, there is my flame. The flame, you really want your flame to be able to consume the, uh, the smoke. It's a lot cleaner if you create that flue with your rake and it'll burn your volatiles. So now I've got the volatiles are burning with the flame and uh, the water is, uh, is steaming off. So what the coal is doing now is the water packs it. And the coal is acting like a insulation blanket, but it's also changing from the coal to the coat. And you can tell when you've got a good heat, when um, you start seeing that really lovely orange amber in the, in the middle of your fire. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't want my fire to go hollow. In other words, I don't wanna burn the fuel out from underneath. So I'm gonna pack it from the sides. Now, what you'll wanna do there are three types of fires that you can run. I always feed the coal from the side, and then from the side I'm added over to the top once it's coked. So I'm put a little bit more coal in here. I put a lot of coal in there. That doesn't mean I'm burning it, I'm coking it. And I'm going to control the amount that my coal burns by how much I'm using my blower. Also, I'll control how much it burns by using a tool called a mop. So I just a stick with a shepherd's crook on it, and I'll take this and I'll drizzle water over the fire, circular, and that puts out the sides of my fire. You can also when your fire sometimes is really bright, you can use this on top and that'll darken the, the superficial part of your fire, but it, it won't cool your fire off. And let's see if I've got a heat. That piece of quarter inch round, give me an idea. So again, I'm going in there level. Now, when you, it's hard to forge something that you can't see. So you can use your rake so the rake is basically, this is a piece of quarter inch square. It's got a real simple finial on here. It's something that I found, I think, uh, in one of the blacksmith's workshops or something. And it just, I like it because it's very lightweight. I prefer lightweight tools over heavy tools. About two foot long. And all I did was I forged it out into a blade and then I bent it 90 degrees. So it's real handy for me that, that rake I can go to the bottom of the fire and I get my flue. I can, I can use it to bring coal up from the sides of the fire. But I can also move coal around so I can see my piece of steel. So it'll, it'll, in fact, when you move the coal around, you think, oh, that's not gonna get very hot. But it, it, and actually what happens is, is that when you remove the coal from that area, that's the place that actually gets hottest because that's your exhaust, so that's the path of least resistance. That's where your air is gonna come through. So you can control the heat of your fire if you want to by moving the coal around. So you can see that that piece of steel is nested in those coals. And this, the nice thing about that is it's not really burning the sides. The, if, if it is, it's providing heat. And uh, it's, re, it's reflecting all of that heat into that, that piece of steel. So, so I, can, I can keep my eye on it. So this is my heat right now, and that's a middle heat. Um, 
I can get an end heat if I want, so I'll just put it in that little space. And uh, sometimes I turn it just to see where the end is. So I can see the end here. And it's important to get to know your fire pot. So your fire pot, this one is a big fire pot. It's for making really long forgings that whirlwind, uh, champion whirlwind. But um, I can control that, like I said, with the mop and the sprinkler. So now I've got, I've got a good heat. That's a good forging heat. And it's the end heat, okay? I'll make a little tong clip out of that so I don't waste the heat or the material. Let's come over here. Now, as the coal forge gets pretty bright and you're looking in that, that cave, you may want to have a, a, those furnace, number three furnace flip down so that it's more comfortable to your eye. This bar, I plan on making this multi-tool out of. And so I've marked eight inches on this. Again, from the last video, I'm gonna push this against, find the angle. That way when I hit that, we'll get all the vibration. And then there's my mark. So I'm gonna take a heat on this. So I'll pour two irons in the fire. I'll make a tongue clip. The ones that I use a lot, and these are Hoffy style tongue clips. Can't can't say enough uh, words of uh, praise for Uri Hoffy. What a what a mind on that man! But uh, these are real simple tools, and that I can hold on to it here, and I can put them on my tongs, and I can slide them up, and it'll give me a variable amount of uh, tension on that, which will increase that resistance there. So it's just a really great tool. And um, you can make them pretty, pretty simply. I'll, I'll, forge, I'll forge a sequence on how to make this. So when I stand at the anvil, just like what I talked about last time, and I'll move some of this stuff. Stand sideways at the anvil. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the edge of the anvil to bend. Uh, I could use the radius edge, as I showed you last time, or I can use the broken edge here. I don't really want to use a sharp edge. So, uh, a little bit more, maybe half as much more than the face of the hammer. And I'm gonna tilt the hammer just like this. So it's as if I'm coming down like a, like a slice. I'm gonna tilt the hammer just like that. I'm gonna flip this around and I'm gonna close this up onto itself let it pass and then I'm going to raise this just a little bit so I kicked it down brought it over and now I'm going to push this back to make that shape right there so on a, on a hand crank the nice thing about this coal forge is that when you're working at the anvil it's not consuming coal. So it's, uh, it's, it's very efficient by, it's very nature, it's, it's very efficient. So, so far I've shown you the rake, I've shown you the shovel. I use the shovel quite a bit to pack the fire tight. I've shown you the sprinkler. I'm gonna sprinkle the back of this with a mop, sprinkle it. So I don't burn too much fuel back here. Some people prefer the, and this is called an Arkansas sprinkler. So you've got a can and you can tilt it this way to get water out of it, or you can tilt it this way to get a sprinkle out of it. So it's just got holes that are drilled there at the top. And so it's a, it's a nice tool. So we'll go back to bending again, and I'll let that sit in the fire. So again, a little bit, about half as much more. I'm gonna shift that down. I'm gonna bring it around. Let it pass by itself. I'm hitting real close to where the apex of that bend. Then I'm gonna hook it here. I'm gonna bring this around. And the angled hammer blow drives it back onto the anvil. Now I'm gonna put this all in the same plane. Now what I wanna do is I wanna use that same sh shifting hammer blow 
and I'm bending this part right here. So that's all bent, but I need to tighten up that bend and I can do it here at a Pritchell and it only needs to come around so that it hangs on to that, the tong rein. It doesn't have to come around further, any further than that. Okay, so that's, that's the sequence right there. Now I'm gonna quench these both. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do the next sequence to, to a finished tongue clip. Now this is a tunnel fire, so I, I can push my stock through the other side and I can get a middle heat. So you can see that my stock is on the other side and uh, I don't want it to be on the other side. Actually, I want to get a heat right where that eight inches is. But I wanted to show you that you can build a tunnel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep packing it from the side. And you can put like a piece of coke over it. And then you can fill that with a little bit of coal. You can find another piece of coal over here. And eventually what you can build is a cave. So this is a tunnel. I can build a cave. Now, again, if you get too much, uh, not enough, too much smoke and on the flame, find the bottom of your fire and you see the difference that that made. Now I have my flu. Now my hood is getting to the point in time where eh, it's not perfect, but uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's exhausting. Now I'm gonna get, so I've got three irons in the fire. Usually I don't do that because uh, it's too many for me, but um, in this case, it's a real simple forging of the tong clips. And uh, so this bar is ready. So again, about one and a half diameter or one and a half thicknesses of the hammer. Bring this around, let it pass. Bring it around like that. Put it all in one plane. Now I can bend this part, finish it up in the Pritchell Straighten it up a little bit. Now I'm gonna nick that right here. Soft steel, nicking that about right there. So when I put it back in the fire, I'll have a handle. It's a very quiet, relaxing, rhythmic way of heating steel with the hand crank blower. So eventually what I'm going to need is a pair of tongs and these are monkey hands, some early monkey hands with a super groove, but a not an improved super groove because I don't have that slit out um, pocket on the, in the inside. I made these in um, 90, 97 and uh, engraved my name in there. Uh, we had a Japanese metalsmith come to the metal museum and he showed me engraving. I showed him blacksmith thing. His name is Humi Nagami from uh, Hiroshima. Humito Nagami. Yeah, I haven't said his name in 20 years, but uh, he's a really cool guy. A professor out of Hiroshima University and he wanted to learn blacksmithing. So he heard, heard that the best place to learn blacksmithing was a metal museum. And so I took him under my wing and um, showed him everything I knew, and he's an incredible metalsmith. Anyway, so I'm going to get my tongs ready. I'm going to lay my hardy down so that I don't injure, injure myself. And I've got a heat, so here's my, move that magnet out of the way, about one and a half times. Flip it over. Hook it. Same plane. Bend this. Bring it around. Now, up there. And I'm gonna nick it to the brittle black. Straighten it up. Just a little bit of heat. There we go. Grab it about here. And I'm gonna bend this the same way here. Flip it over, bring it around, put it all on one plane. I have a, some magnets here that 
for sparking. So there's there's a tongue clip. And uh, I should probably go ahead and make a tongue clip out of that, but I got heat on that, so I'll, I'll do that. So from here, flip it. So you can twist it off. Always drop your stock to your side when you're pulling stock out of the fire, coming to the anvil, especially around other people. If you don't have a tapered heel, you can do the same thing here. Notice how I'm choking up on the hammer. If you don't have a critchel, you can hang this up here. And there's your tongue clip. As long as it reaches um, like a, a third to a half way around, then, then that's gonna be enough. I'll quench this and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if I'm holding on to, for instance, this, you don't want it to come all the way around. That's enough. Now, uh, you'll want to file that or sand that. I just picked up a piece of steel and it had a weird burr on it, but, but you can see that that's the idea behind these. This pair of tongs was made out of 5160, some coil spring. Um, so now I got two more tong clips. So I just wanted to show you that sequence. I'll also show you how to remove my hardy sounds it's easier than the fire. I also wanted to show you how I would get a couple pieces of steel hot in the coal fire, how I manage my heat. So um, the nice thing about a coal fire is it keeps you busy because there's at no point in time should you just like assume that you've got the heat that you need, that you've got the fuel that you need. You're always building your fire. I'll, I'll use my rake to pack the fire also. I don't get too much smoke. There's my flue. And then I also know that where I, my flue is, is where that's the path of least resistance, and that's where I'm going to have the most heat. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to forge this into an oval, the whole thing into an oval. So I don't need to take a heat on the whole thing because I'm going to forge and heat what I can forge. So let's go back to the anvil. Clean my anvil. All I'm going to do is I'm going to locate my, that's where I hit it on the edge of the anvil. And I'm going to forge this into an oval. Now, now I'm hitting here, but I'm going to walk it towards that mark. And that way I can get in an even shoulder on both sides. And I'm going to do the same thing from the top. I'm going to start here and I'm going to walk the hammer to the edge of the, where that transition is. And I think it's really important to have clean transitions. Now, this is that second stage where I'm using a little bit of my elbow and my um, wrist. So once you get to close to that edge, stay there. And what I'm looking for is that my transition is the same on both sides. I'm not quite there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pump the heat up just a little bit more and clean up my transition. And while I'm doing this, I'm gonna put a little bit more fuel in there. Remember that formula where one pound I'll be able to get One pound of steel hot. Unless I put it on top, I put it on the sides. And then the coke that was on the sides is now pushed deeper in the fire. And that's what's feeding the fire. And the coal that's wet is what's now insulating the fire. And so if I look inside the fire a lot, I want to drop my lens down. And that three is just enough to take that sharp edge off. And I'll do that when I'm forge welding him. It's so much nicer to forge weld. Now, Smith's like the hand crank blower because you're using your right arm for your hammer or vice versa. And then the left arm doesn't get much work. So in this case, both sides of your body get a workout. So I've got my heat, clean my anvil. And I'm gonna make sure that I get a a clean transition. So I'm gonna walk my hammer 
and I'm gonna ovalize it like um, it'll be about three eighths by five eighths. I don't wanna go too far down. We talked a little bit about that last time um, where if you, um, the ratio of containment is one to two to one to three, but if you go much past that, then you're past your ratio of containment. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've got my transition there, my transition there. Straighten up my bar. And now I'm gonna take another heat from here to the end of the bar. So don't waste a good part of your heat straightening your bar. Do that before you put it back in the fire. So now my, my bar is ready for the next heat. It's got a little longer, so I may need my, my tool rest. So this is a tunnel fire. You can, again, you can take some of your coal, charcoal, pieces of, and you can start putting it on top and that would make a cave. And a cave is gonna give you the most efficient fire because you're not gonna lose much heat at all. It is gonna make it a little difficult uh, to have a middle heat so a cave fire is something like this. And then what I'll do is I'll move this over just a little bit. So that's your cave. So if you're forging some real delicate things, but you need an intense heat, then uh, you may want to build a cave. That's where you bring your coal, your cooked coal to the sides. You scoop it up on the back. And then the only opening is that's left is the opening here. And sometimes I'll take a piece of Coke. That's a nice piece of Coke. And I'll show you this. That's, that's, what, that's what you get when you wet your coal before you put it on the fire. It cokes up real nice like that. So now that becomes not only fuel, but also refractory. And now the only opening I have is that opening right there. So the nice thing about coal is that you can build these different types of fires because the coal coats. Once the coal is coked, it doesn't stick together anymore and you have just a coke fire, and that's fine. It's clean, you don't get any much, very much of the smoke, but uh, you don't have that tailoring of that fire. So, so now I'm, so I've, I've cleaned up my transition. I'm gonna make sure I'm the same plane. Now I'm gonna pull the stock underneath the hammer. Again, I get about 60% of my work from the top, 40% from the bottom. So I want, a, I want an even forging. I wanna continue to rotate it. Now forge to finish, only, only forge what you feel like you can forge. Once it gets to about this heat, that's your finishing heat. So at this point in time, you wanna do your straightening. And now my bar is straight. I've got clean transition. It's consistent. I've forged it top and bottom. And now I'm just gonna heat this. I'm forging inside out. I start with eight. We'll measure it afterwards. We'll probably go to like nine or so. So hammer, hammer polishing, breaking the scale off, cracking it. Now I'm gonna just heat this. Nice thing about forging it from the inside out is that since that's pinched, this will get hot and this won't get as hot because that, that material, just like anything else, it doesn't, if you pinch the conduit, then it doesn't allow it to flow through that conduit. So. Um, so now I'll really be able to control that heat, be able to get the end hot, and I'll work it from the inside out. And we'll, this is as far as we'll go today. I also wanna show you an open fire and then how to stop your day when, once you're done. So uh, I, I, could, I could use a little bit more. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll wait on that because this, this is like one of the last heats. But I would continue to make the mud I would continue to control my burn. And again, you could use the mop, and you know how much how that darkens the fire. So it's not so hard on your eyes, but they are old socks. Um, but uh, it doesn't diminish the heat inside there. So now I, I have this cave and it's just like, it's just a divine heat. I've got a nice bed of coals underneath. Take a look at that. So that is a very efficient way of forging the coal appears to be cold, it's, it's 
glowing orange. That orange temperature tells me it's around 2,000 degrees. That 2,000 is a good temperature for forging. Much hotter than that, you're going to get a lot of grain growth. You're going to get close to the melting temperature, 23, 2400 of medium and high carbon steels. So this is just a good temperature. This steel is nice and soft. And I have a theory about coal forging is that, and this gets into metallurgy, but uh, when we transform from the body center to the face centered crystal structure, that makes the metal slip and twin. So it allows the crystals of that steel to flow. And I think that you get a saturated heat in a coal forge versus a gas forge, and you get more complete and quicker transformation uh, from the body to the face centered cubic structure. Something to think about if you're into metallurgy. We'll talk about metallurgy later in the series. So I've got my heat. I remember I was telling you that it chokes it off here. I'm gonna work off the anvil. So I'm gonna pull the stock to my hammer. And I'm gonna forge to finish. That's 60%, here's my 40%. And the same thing, I'm pulling my stock. Now what's off the anvil doesn't lose its heat as fast as what's on the anvil. So I've, I've flipped it around so I can get an even forging. Now here, I'm gonna make a point is, I'm gonna hit it with about half as much force. Now it, that depends too. If, if you have less heat, you may have to keep the same force. But the reason why I changed it is because now I'm hitting it with a full hammer blow or half a hammer blow, but if I have a full hammer swing, then it's gonna taper. So when I get to the end of the bar, depending on my heat, I'll, I'll diminish the hammer blow to compensate for the fact is that I've got half as much forging for the same amount of force. So that's the, that's the initial forging. You're taking round bar, turning it into an oval, and that's an important step in blacksmithing. It's a beautiful shape. It's something to take in consideration. It's something that we can make. I can, I can make it thinner, but I don't want to make it any thinner if I plan on going to the next stage on this, which is rocking it on the pooch. So the ends of that oval make a pooch and I can rock that on the pooch and I can make a, a square out of it. I can also forge a rhombus if I wanted to. So, so that would be the next step in the forging. And, and we'll wait on that for the next, uh, for the next lecture because I think that this is enough material to chew. So I'll, I always put hot steel on the floor, keep it away from people stepping on it. You don't want to burn your boots, but it's expensive. Now, if your steel doesn't fit in the fire, then what you can do is you can make an open fire. An open fire is not as efficient as the cave or as the tunnel. But if I needed to, I could make an open fire like this. So I could put something in here and I could heat a longer heat, you can get a little bit more blast going through there. There we go. So the open fire is for larger stock that you're going to be moving around quite a bit. Now I'm using the rake as an example, but can you get some air over here and get some air over here too. So notice where I poke holes that's where the air comes up, and then that's where I get my heat. Okay, now I've got a longer heat. This one just started off cold, so it's... So you can move it back and forth in the fire to get a longer heat. Let it nest in those coals. So the heat comes off of the coals, not so much from the air, but from the coals. If I'm, heat, I'm heating my rake, and I still need to pack it. So here's my heat with an open fire. And so I've got a heat from there to there. Okay.
and I'm not going to use that because let's just demonstrate. So now what I want to do is, uh, if you're done for the day, it's not a bad idea to build your fire up. Now, if I wanted to continue, sometimes you want to do is you want to go to the bottom of your fire with your poker. So if I was going to continue to forge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to take my poker and I'm going to find the, the edge of that fire pot. And I'm going to go to the bottom of it and I'm going to lift. And if the whole fire lifts, then I've got a clinker in there that's, uh, that's obscuring the, the heat. There's my clinker. Sometimes if you're cranking and cranking, and it's like, man, nothing is happening, you may want to take your poker, get to the bottom of your fire, and lift. And if it's lifting, ooh, this is some gooey clinker right here, then you know that that's why you're not getting much heat. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull that out. That's, that's clinker. And depending on the quality of your coal, and we've only been forging for about an hour, but this, this coal isn't the best quality, but you just, you work with what you have. I'm gonna lift. And then that's clinker right there. It looks gooey. It looks like it's like toffee or something. And you can hear it. That's why they, that's why they call it clinker. And it, it really, you know, I was cranking pretty hard to get that quarter inch hot. Now, it, now the fire's breathing again. Okay, so. So if you continue with your forging for the day, make sure you take your poker and clean your fire. Make sure you, don't, you get that clinker out. Sometimes you can lift it with your clinker breaker, but I, I trust keeping it in one piece. I've seen clinkers, a complete circle, really thick, to the point in time where you're not getting any airflow whatsoever. So if you're cranking and cranking and you're not getting any airflow, clean your fire, but I bet you've got a lot of clinker. All right, now when I'm done for the day, which I am, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna break up the fire with my shovel. Let's see, here's my, oh, here it is. I'm gonna break up my fire with my shovel. And I'm gonna take these lovely pieces of Coke, move them over, and I'm gonna save those for when I wanna make a cave. Now, this is all Coke. Very little coal, so it's mostly Coke. And I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up. And when you open up the coke, it doesn't burn as well. Remember, I was talking about that air gate. If you, if you have an air gate with coke, it'll. Now I'm not confusing. I'm not saying, oh, this is coke. This is coal that's been coked. So uh, you'll use those phrases when you're using coal quite a bit. Now I'm gonna go about halfway into my fire pot and pull it out of my fire pot. But I'm not gonna go any further than that because what I wanna do is, when I, when I come back to this, I wanna clean out my fire pot and remove any clinkers in the bottom of it. So at the end of the day, this is what you should do. And now, I would say that this person is very thoughtful because they made plenty of coke, they didn't burn it all the way down, there's not a lot of ash on the hearth, and uh, they didn't disturb what's in the bottom of the fire pot because what's in the bottom of the fire pot is your is the coal ash and clinker, and you don't want that interspersed with uh, with your with your fuel. So what I've done today is hopefully you got a better idea as far, as far as what the coal forge does, how to light a coal forge, how to build the fire, how to maintain the fire, the different tools that we use in the coal forge, the different fuels you want to use in a coal forge. Uh, how to build the different three different styles of fire in your in your forge and then ultimately what to do when you're done for the day sometimes you want to build your fire when you're done for the day so that you can build that coke up so that next time you start you don't have to start with green coal which will burn and actually burns pretty well because the tar and the volatiles they catch on fire pretty easily but uh, it makes a hell of a smoky mess so uh, you're at more peace with your neighbors, um, with uh, people that you're working with. If you work uh, 
starting your fire with, with your pre-coked coal. Thank you very much for watching. Right, boy? Right.